good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning for those who are joining us from the Americas. Uh, and welcome to this online event, which is going to discuss the effects of coronavirus uh, on Latin America, an event organized by the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. My name is Bela Scholtes. I am Senior Research Fellow of the Institute. And we have three distinguished scholars with us from three different continents, uh, actually three different countries, sorry. Uh, Lucy Pedrosa is Professor of Political Science at uh, Colegio de Mexico. Until very recently, she has been a Senior Research Fellow at GIGA, German Institute of Global and Area Studies. And her field of expertise is the analysis of diaspora policies and citizenship policies. Uh, we have with us Patricia Villan, Research Fellow at the Department of Sociology at the University of Campinas, Brazil. Her research focuses on the integration of immigrants to the labor market in Brazil. And we have with us Sandor Dulanaj, professor at the Department of World Economy at Corvinus University of Budapest and senior research fellow at the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. He has been the author and editor of a series of economic and political analyses uh, issued by our Institute about Latin America. So the event will be structured in the following way. We will discuss basically three uh, broad questions in approximately 50 minutes after which we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, you see a questions and answers Q&A tab in the bottom uh, of your screen. Please use this uh, in case you would like to ask from the panelists. You will have the opportunity to ask at the end uh, of the event and I will read out loud uh, the questions that you have posted in the Q&A tab. Uh, and I would like to uh, let you know also that the event is being recorded and it will be published on the website of the Institute later on and it is also broadcasted on Facebook Live. Uh, we have a really fortunate disciplinary setting here, uh, even though the topic itself is quite unfortunate, but uh, it's a fortunate thing that we have on board a political scientist, a sociologist and an economist, so we can discuss the topic from different angles. Um, so I believe that there will be uh, many things to discuss. I would like to uh, uh, give my uh, first question to all three panelists. Basically, I would like to start the discussion with some sort of uh, short analysis of what were the political and governance factors that conditioned the response of, um, of Latin American countries to the coronavirus outbreak. And we have discussed that we would go uh, country by country, starting with Brazil, then with Mexico, and then uh, with the rest of the countries focusing on Venezuela um, a bit more. So Patricia, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Ibella Sotes for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to me to take part in this webinar, to collaborate with the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. And it's also a pleasure to share this session with Lucy Pedrosa and Sandro Nagy. So the whole world is living a very hard crisis, but the situation in Latin America is worse than in the rest of the world. According to uh, Julio Berdegue, who works for FAO, at FAO, Latin America has 8.5% of the world's population, but have 17% of the official persons infected by COVID. And due to this crisis, 20 million additional persons in Latin America will face insecurity, uh, um, food insecurity this year. So it's very important to, to discuss this situation here, both regarding the sanitary and the socioeconomic aspect. Well, my presentation will focus uh, Brazil. No, my, my answer in this, uh, this question will focus Brazil. Unfortunately, my country is the epicenter of the epidemic today, and I will explain some factors that may help us to understand why. And the first important thing to make clear is regarding this situation in Brazil is that Corona crisis doesn't, doesn't come as a thunder in the blue sky. And we have been living in a very deep economic, political and uh, social crisis for the last six and seven years. So the pandemic came as a bomb 
in a country with strong political chaos, with economical and social big troubles. And uh, the response to coronavirus outbreak in Brazil followed the standard um, of our policies being implemented by the right-wing government led by Bolsonaro. This standard has a mix of some particularities connected to the historical formation of Brazil, that's, it, that's, it, that's it, its colonial background, also with a strong influence of the way Donald Trump is governing US. So the, the basis of this policy is authoritarianism. Attila Melege is the reference to understand the logic of authoritarianism in a global scale today. That's an Hungarian uh, author. And it has a disrespect for the law and the institution, especially in the case of Brazil for the judiciary power and the use of fraud and fake news and uh, the control and the state violence against the most vulnerable social groups, uh, especially here in Brazil, the indigenous and the black people and the favela residents. And also there is a continued, uh, continuity and a deepening of a neoliberal agenda. And um, this form of government is to create the, the will of this form of government is to create chaos and after to justify the intervention of a military government and uh, under the allegation that it is necessary to maintain the country institu institutional stability as uh, a red head happened in Brazil in the coup d'etat in 1964, uh, 96 uh, some years ago. So let's talk now about some response in the area of health that's important for us. So the first minister of health was dismissed because he refused to apply some absurd measures required by Bolsonaro, like the end of the social distancing and the indiscriminate use of chlorotecnina. That's a drug that he, they, they are using here in Brazil. So his successor resigned also after less than one month due to some reasons. And currently we have a general as a new temporary minister, as he's a military, with, and he has no experience in this field of health. So the current ministers changed the way of presenting cases and deaths in, in Brazil of COVID. And on Sunday, 7, the government even ratified the numbers of deaths initially publicized by reducing them in a half. So there is a tremendous lack of transparency and they are trying to show to the population that the situation is under control. But uh, actually it represents a very authoritarian way to deal with the pand pandemic. Some authors call it, call it necropolitics and uh, there are many urgencies that are uh, emerging in the country and they don't receive response, response or they, they receive response completely ineffective or if not harmful. Hence, uh, let's see the, the discourse of the government about the, the COVID. They deny the need for social distancing, they deny the risk and the existence even the existence of coronavirus. Like Trump, they say that it's a Chinese virus to weaken the West and to spread communism. Even the Minister of Foreign Affairs said it. And Bolsonaro also says, oh, it's just an ordinary flu and some people will die, but what can we do? So there is a, an effort to convince, convince people to disobey the social distancing that's, that is the, that is, has been implemented in Brazil by the government of many states and major cities of Brazil. And this discourse incentives people to keep working and to continue doing everything as if nothing was happening. And again, like Trump, there is a criticism to the World Health Association. So this discourse generates confusion in the population 
made the social distance policy not so successful and made it very difficult to implement public health plan to combat the virus. So until now we have like more than 43,000 deaths and almost 900,000 cases. And uh, we are the second in the world in the cases and the deaths. And obviously these effects are still to come. And the, the, the situation is already terrible, uh, but we expect further infections and deaths. And uh, it's also important to say that this data is also certainly underestimated because Brazil has a huge lack of tests even if you compare to Latin America standard, it's a shame like per capita in Brazil, we test less than Cuba and less than Paraguay. Hence, the, the specialists say that we should multiply, uh, multiply at least for seven to have the real numbers uh, of the infected. And um, uh, they are also uh, implemented demagogic measures to combat the virus without basis in scientific studies, like they are selling the idea that the drug chloroquine uh, is the solution to the pandemic. Now the Minister of Health um, is uh, implementing it in the health, uh, public health system. And um, so uh, it's very important as well to understand that these problems uh, are also the result of policies in the near past, uh, especially regard the neoliberal agenda that has been implemented in Brazil um, in a very ha hard attack to the health public system. And uh, also there are uh, they are they, they were implementing plans to privatize as much as possible um, the health service uh, denying the, the therefore the importance of universal and free system of health by the way it's important to state that uh, in Brazil uh, we have free and universal health system but in practice the lack of funds creates a lot of problem so um, uh, also I need to remember that, uh, to remind you that in 2008, the discourse of Bolsonaro against the Cuban doctors in Brazil has provoked the expulsion of more than 5,000 uh, uh, Cuban doctors of the country. And uh, we had a, a rather lack of doctors and in this expulsion, left 35 million Brazilians without assistance of a doctor. And um, he says that the Cuban government decided it unilaterally, but it's not true. He's expulsed these doctors and uh, it had a very negative effect uh, also during the pandemic. And so finally, I, I will uh, talk shortly about the, uh, this response in economic and uh, uh, errors. Of course, this uh, response are seeking and, and deepen the social and, and uh, the conflicts and the inequalities. And they, these policies are oriented by the principle that state role should be minimal. There is an injection of potent money uh, to respond the emergence, but predicting an even more severe austerity plan for the next year. We know, therefore, that the areas of health, of education, social protection uh, will be the most affected. Uh, uh, actually, the Paulo Guedes, the, who is the Minister of the Economy, first reaction to the crisis was threatening the defense of deeper liberal reforms in Brazil. And after, later, the decree of calamity enabled the government to, in, to make some counter measures, like they uh, created an emergency income of $120 for informal works, and, but it's, uh, of course, uh, it's for three months and it's uh, clearly insufficient. And, and now in Brazil, we have millions of unemployed people, problems of starvation, and um, also the bureaucracy to, the, to give access to, to this emergency income is 
uh, rule out uh, many persons to have access to, to, to this right. And um, uh, at the same time, there was authorization for the temporary suspicion of the works contracts for two months and the reduction of 75% in their working hours and wages for three months as well. And many companies are doing this reduction of work salaries and uh, I will give some uh, numbers more, um, uh, later. And there is also additional flexibilization of the labor market and uh, there are some measures to provide liquidity for the banks and credits for the company. However, uh, it uh, doesn't work as expected because the government gives money to the banks with very low interest, but they lend to small companies with much higher interest. So hence, both the sanitary uh, and the economic situation are dramatic. And it's the, only the beginning. Uh, things will unfortunately get much, much worse uh, this year. Thank you very much, Patricia, for this uh, resume of, of quite a difficult and problematic situation that Brazil is witnessing these days. Uh, let's continue with discussing how the thing is in, in Mexico. I was just checking the data, and Mexico comes second in Latin America right now uh, in the number of deaths after Brazil. So, Lucy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bella. And I want to uh, say thanks to you, of course, for this uh, kind invitation to participate in this talk today and also greet my co-panelists, uh, Patricia and Shandor. It's been very interesting to, to listen to Patricia's report on Brazil. And it's good to be second because Mexico is not only second in the number of, of deaths, unfortunately, but also I would say it's, uh, it's midway uh, between Brazil and, and many, let's say the average of response of other countries in Latin America. So I think it's, it's good to illustrate what Mexico has been doing or not. And um, first of all, I would like to um, state some general characteristics of what I think has um, defined the response in Mexico to the pandemic so far. Uh, so the first characteristic is that, is that there, has no be, there has not been a strict confinement uh, with uh, you know, a hardline curfew or militarized responses. Uh, the confinement has stayed from the beginning until now at the level of a very strong recommendation uh, of the government to stay home. But there have, there have no, not been uh, very strict prohibitions uh, to go to the street or to, to do your activities. So um, even if you compare Mexico to other countries in the region and in the world, even the movement restrictions are very low in Mexico. So it has always been possible to arrive in, Me in the Mexican International Airport, for example, up until today. Mexico is one of the very few countries in the world that has been very light about restricting uh, international travel. The other characteristic is low uh, emergency social spending. So if you compare it to other cases, even in Latin America, Mexico is devoting very few, relatively very few resources to emergency responses in terms of social and economic policies. And the third, um, the third characteristic of the response is, is um, a level of, of high insecurity. Now, regarding the, the, the numbers that are reported, which we know are very difficult to compare to begin with, because it's, it's hard to find um, trustworthy relative measures uh, across countries, but it's important to state that Mexico follows a sentinel model. So I'm not an expert, I'm not an epidemiologist, but this is a, an epidemiological surveillance system that uh, bases, a, base, bases a lot on, on surveying methods of statistics. So this, the system, the, the main characteristic of the system is that massive testing is not conducted. The Mexican uh, SARS of uh, epidemiology who are conducting the Mexican response, federal response, have ruled out from the beginning that 127 million Mexicans can be tested. So from the beginning, they, they decided for a strategy of no, no massive testing. 
And instead of that, they are conducting the Sentinel model, which results in a, in a severe underreporting of cases. So regardless of whatever uh, comparisons we try to make across countries, we have to bear in mind that even the leaders of the uh, strategy, um, response strategy in Mexico are warning us that the numbers could be as eight times as higher as they are re being reported. So um, now coming to the question of uh, what um, what are the structural and, and uh, what are the factors that condition the response to the coronavirus outbreak? I want to speak about four structural factors and three contingent factors. And especially with the four structural factors, I think there is a lot in common between Mexico and other Latin American countries. The first structural factor that I would like to name is high inequality. Uh, in, in the conditions of social security provision and employment. So in a moment like this, this, uh, this high inequality expresses itself in a very fragmented health, uh, health uh, system and a very high informality in the labor market. Just imagine that over 56% 50, 50, uh, of all workers who are generating more than 20% of the gross national product are employed in the informal sector. So at least one third of these people have not been earning any money in the last three months. And, uh, and they really rely on their daily informal activities on the streets, in markets to survive. So this helps us to understand this, this model of, uh, let's say, um, no strict confinement, because many political voices in Mexico under understood very quickly that in a context of high informality in the labor market, you cannot ask people to stay home. People have to go out to earn uh, their livelihood. However, it is also this part of the population who is most exposed and most vulnerable to the virus. And also, it is this part of the population who, who is excluded from the health system and, and, or, or who only has access to very low quality health services. So about uh, half of the population in Mexico have no social protection at all or any access to health. So as in many other countries, as in many other unequal countries, we are seeing that it's the people with lowest resources and who also tend to be the, the ones who are sicker, who, who are the most affected by the pandemic. Uh, a second structural factor I would name is the lack of social trust. And by this, I mean trust in the authorities and trust in the, in the system, in the social system. Across Latin America, but also in Mexico, we see um, white distrust, distrust on some segments of the population over other, which we could, we could call this political polarization. But more seriously, we see the distrust of the population on government, um, on the government strategy, on the government communication, and the government's capacity to, to coordinate the response. So the inconsistent uh, strategy so far, let's say, between the lead scientist, epidemiologist, leading the, the response, and the president, uh, has let people really insecure about whom to trust. So Mexicans don't see their government and their scientific experts speaking with one voice, but instead contradic contradicting each other all the time. So people have to follow their gut instinct in this very insecure situation. Now, very few people have access to inform themselves properly about what is common in other countries or not. And then you have this growing feeling of helplessness in the population, that there is lack of direction, of proper direction. Um, I think one, one statistic that, that really puts this in context is the amount of people, the rate of people who are dying in the first or second days after they get admitted to the hospital. This is 20% of people who get admitted to the hospital suffering from an illness de um, derived from the coronavirus die in the first or the second day. And this tells you that people do not trust the health system. People only go to the hospitals when they feel they cannot really hold it anymore, that they really need help to breathe. And by then it's, it's too late. Now, um, 
One would think that Latin American populations are used to this kind of lack of trust situation that Latin Americans are used to being left on their own in mon moments of crisis, but in moments of crisis like this, coordination is required, at least between the few working hospitals. And what we see is a desperate effort to supplement hospital, the lacking, the weak, the weak health infrastructure with other structures, such as the army, but in a very hopeless matter, because this is not a crisis that can be managed by the use of force. What is now needed is technical expertise, human capital, technology, which we are all lacking. And uh, this we see, for example, not in Mexico, but in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Uh, we have seen over the past months displays of brutal use of force by military and police made to strengthen political leaders in their positions of powers, but actually being able to do very little to contain the spread of the, of the virus. For Mexico, the situation is a bit different and, and worryingly in areas of low state presence, Mafias are regaining power as providers of different services and of immediate help. Um, so the third structural factor I would like to, to name is the lack of coordination between federal and subnational levels. Uh, there's a wide range of variation of what subnational authorities are doing in Mexico, and that is not wrong in itself. I wouldn't like to criticize that sort of, you know, federalism in the response because I don't think it's something wrong in itself. Um, as in many other countries that have a federal structure, you have some governors of subnational units defying uh, uh, or making affronts to the central authority, but this is also not particular to Mexico. In Mexico, however, this sort of federalism, lack of coordination translates in a fragmented response in terms of social and economic measures. So you have some states of the federation devising more ambitious social and economic programs to care for their population, especially in the informal sectors, and others doing practically nothing. And the fourth uh, structural factor, which I think has a lot in common with other Latin American countries is the widespread violence and lack of human security. I think this also characterizes uh, the situation in some Central American countries and perhaps also um, um, in, in Colombia. Um, I would like to leave the three contingent factors for, for the rest of the conversation as not to occupy uh, time, the time that should uh, go, go to Shandor right now. I will just name them. Uh, one is a, a, a very powerful president figure that we have in, in, the, in the person of Andres Manuel López Obrador right now. The second is a sluggish economy. Mexican economy was not doing well even before the pandemic, and now the projections are catastrophic. And third, very important, I think, is that the economic policy that the president has been adopted in his first year and a half of government is one of economic austerity. So he's not a typical leftist populist leader who starts to spend more money for uh, ambitious social programs. Instead, he is funding these ambitious social programs with savings and with austerity programs, cutting back the social spending. Um, and, and, uh, and, and the, the budget of the state. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, that for now. Thank you very much, Lucy. We will continue from there. And now the floor is with Chandler. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I was making some notes while uh, the two professors were uh, speaking about their countries and I have to say that uh, there are some quite uh, not astonishing uh, parallels between uh, these countries and the most of the Latin American countries in the region. Um, I was first prepared to speak mostly about Venezuela but I was um, uh, adding some other um, uh, countries like uh, Cuba and uh, Peru as well. Uh, into the list which um, I would like to touch. Uh, so first, um, uh, Venezuela. Um, the original question was about the uh, political and governance factor. So we all know that uh, in Venezuela, um, the political leadership and the governance in general is, uh, let's say, uh, at best divided uh, between the official um, uh, power holder, uh, Maduro, 
and uh, the opposition led by uh, Juan Guaido. And if we consider that in the last um, few years there was a economic um, collapse and meltdown of uh, Venezuela with uh, hyperinflation, with uh, uh, millions of people fleeing the country due to lack of services and, uh, um, and food supply. Uh, so can you imagine to this um, situation adding uh, something like a coronavirus? Um, just let me uh, say that the official number of uh, Venezuela about uh, the death um, because of the coronavirus are 24. So can you imagine that uh, in the neighboring uh, and regional countries they are, we are speaking about tens of thousands of people and in Venezuela it's 24. Um, obviously the basic question is, uh, is there any test uh, which they can use um, at least to, to prove that the deaths are because of the coronavirus? or um, um, I have some other uh, ideas regarding uh, uh, Bolsonaro type of uh, data collection and um, uh, providing this data online, which is probably not the most transparent in this case as well. Uh, but the question is not just about statistics, but the general health system. If you are uh, following the news from Venezuela, you could hear that um, in the last um, uh, four years, uh, people, due to uh, low food supply, uh, they were um, uh, losing uh, uh, weight in general, uh, several kilos uh, uh, per year. Even uh, Mr. Maduro was saying that uh, the population is on Maduro diet, uh, Google on it. So he was even uh, accepting these kind of um, uh, things what were happening in the country. Uh, we have seen uh, documentaries by uh, um, uh, well, um, um, functioning uh, um, uh, channels like France uh, uh, 24 and uh, other um, uh, public channels um, showing, including BBC, showing the states in the health uh, uh, services that uh, they are lacking uh, basic, and I mean basic, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, even by tidying up uh, a people or just giving a painkiller uh, and and so can you imagine how much uh, tests or how much uh, ventilators they have to, to uh, save lives? So I think that um, uh, anything uh, official which comes from Venezuela, uh, we should rather consider as uh, uh, not really reliable. And if you add to all this situation that um, uh, several thousands of people, mostly from Colombia, are going back to Venezuela, because in Colombia they had a uh, uh, quite high level of curfew and uh, uh, restrictions in, uh, in mostly in Bogota and, and other bigger cities as well. So most of the Venezuelan refugees who were selling things um, or participating in basic uh, services, uh, uh, service providers, simply they cannot uh, earn any money and they are going back to Venezuela because um, from zero uh, income, you simply cannot even survive in, in Colombia as well. And we could see some footages that uh, people at the, uh, the Venezuelan border were put in um, uh, small uh, empty uh, schools, um, sticking together next to each other without uh, um, much uh, uh, help. Uh, for the 14 days uh, uh, lockdown before entering the country uh, without testing any of them. So obviously in Venezuela we can see some uh, uh, quite big problems, but um, uh, we don't see any solution on the political level which could uh, simply uh, lead out uh, from this point. We can see um, not just in Venezuela, but even in the case of Cuba, uh, increasing uh, sanctions from the United States which is uh, absolutely worsening the situation in, in both of the countries in economic sense. And obviously this is not helping fighting the, uh, the coronavirus neither. And with this, I would like to change a bit for Cuba, uh, which probably you all know that they have a quite uh, a high level of doctors, actually the highest level of doctors in, in the population, ratio of the population. Uh, in, in whole Latin America, and they were even uh, providing medical uh, and healthcare uh, uh, stuff for Italy and for other countries. And this was a quite um, um, 
generous uh, way uh, from Cuba and try efficient way to increase their popularity among a certain level of uh, uh, politicians and, and the population. So they were quite using it quite well, um, this possibility to spread their um, uh, health missions, what they were uh, cut off from uh, Bolivia and, and uh, Brazil in the last uh, two years. Um, and anyway, I have some uh, news from my friends who are working uh, uh, in Cuban hospitals that the test, why, what they are receiving um, uh, as a generous offer from uh, China, um, nearly half of them is not functioning well and uh, not showing the same result using for the same uh, um, um, people uh, one and uh, um, in the days or even just hours uh, and the same person, which means that these tests are not really reliable. And probably this is a general problem, not just in Cuba, but in whole uh, Latin American countries, that the numbers, probably if they are counting it, uh, probably they are not reliable due to the lack of, um, of tests, uh, uh, what they have. And um, uh, while this, I am going um, uh, just touching very shortly on Peru, uh, which is another uh, country with a really high percentage of uh, um, informal um, employment. So most of uh, uh, the people are working uh, without official uh, um, contract, which means that the social um, coverage uh, and the health system, they are not um, uh, included. And this is a huge problem, not just uh, uh, if they got uh, uh, the coronavirus, but in general. And obviously, uh, this is another problem if uh, there is a curfew, which in, in most of the uh, bigger cities in, in Peru, at least they are partially uh, restrictions. And the people who are, again, um, working in some of the uh, industries and service sectors, uh, which uh, they need people on the streets simply uh, this is a kind of middle class luxury to permit uh, Im itself to go on home office and, and stay at home. Uh, most of um, uh, the, these people uh, in most of these Latin American countries simply cannot uh, make this because they are earning their livings from one day to another. So going even just for days or weeks, and right now we are speaking about months, uh, going back to home and, and not doing anything, it's simply, it's, it's not the answer uh, in most of these people. Thank you very much, Sandor. Thank you for all, all three of you for this quite dark but comprehensive picture of, of the overall uh, setting in Latin America. Now with my second question, I would like to uh, go a bit deeper into the analysis of the situation from a political perspective. Uh, so my Actually, there are many uh, things already here on the table. Uh, Bolsonaro firing the health minister, two health ministers, actually. Um, the military, the, the possibility of, of, of police stepping in. So there, uh, the, the, the frictions between the federal and, and uh, the lower levels of governance. So we see sort of similarities, but also obviously differences between different countries. But my second question would be, what kind of tensions or ruptures uh, could be observed between different political actors in Latin American countries in the past three months? So uh, by political actors, I mean uh, different levels of governance or different institutions or different political parties. So what sort of tensions or ruptures do you see? Uh, let's go back to Brazil. So Patricia, the floor is yours. Okay, so here in Brazil, there are many tensions and uh, even some ruptures uh, with the political institutions and in relation to the higher, the lower and the middle class with the current government. We can say actually that Brazil is a bomb which is almost exploding uh, due to the health, the socio-economic and also the political crisis. So let's see, with, within the government, there was a weakening in the support of, Go of Bolsonaro by the, some center uh, parties. And very importantly, there are serious tensions between Bolsonaro and the judiciary power due to the judicial lawsuits uh, against Bolsonaro and his family uh, related to the fake news in the elections 
and also related uh, to Cyril's involvement of him and his family with the militias, that is the paramilitar power. And the Bolsonaro treats uh, threatens uh, the Supreme Court, saying that if the judicial lawsuits continue, the militaries will have to take control of the Supreme Court. And uh, the Minister of uh, Justice, uh, Sergio Moro, that had a protagonist role in the coup d'etat against the President Dilma Rousseff and uh, in the election uh, of Bolsonaro, because he was responsible for the car wash operation, which uh, put Lula in jail and therefore became for a part of the population, a leader of uh, the alleged anti-corruption struggle in Brazil. So Moro is also, resi also resigned, he's not more the, the Minister of Justice, and he's accusing Bolsonaro of political interference in the federal policy to defend his family. So also with the media, there are many tensions with this government. For example, the newspaper that are critical regarding the government made a coalition and starting counting the deaths and infected by coronavirus on their own and to serve as an alternative source of information regarding the numbers uh, displayed by uh, this government. And there is also polarization regarding the support uh, to this government. Even among the businessmen, some of them still support Bolsonaro, but some others not anymore. At the popular level, it's clear that parts of the population of the lower class and the middle class supports the government and it's related uh, to Bolsonaro power over the Protestant church and to the emergency aid that they have been provided for informal works and to his demagogic discourse saying that is the, uh, that he's the one uh, who is trying to save the economy and hence jobs. And he's also partially related, this support is also partially related to the emergence of fascism in Brazil that's happened also in other parts of the world. And when Bolsonaro says that Brazil can't stop, He's trying to say that if there is an economic recession and the explosion of unemployment, it's not his fault. And this motto, Brazil can, can't stop, is a motto from the dictatorship. So Bolsonaro is obtaining more popular support, mostly due to the emergency income, to the labor class, and due to this discourse. And more than being against the, the social distancing, he is claiming he supported to violently make this militants against this policy of social distancing. So uh, Bolsonaro also knows that there are many proofs that could take him to of, took him out of power. So he's also involving uh, involved in the policy. Uh, in a policy to liberalize the possession of guns by the population. And many analysts are saying that this is strategy be is because his, uh, if he gives guns to his supporters, they will fight against a possible impeachment uh, against him. So, but, um, but uh, it need, I need to say that it's an increasing part of the population that's not satisfied with this government. So recent polls are showing that those who consider Bolsonaro government as very bad, bad or regular are red 70%. And um, uh, it's clear that desperation and hunger is being followed as well by increasing demands from the worker class. There are manifestations of workers from Uber, for example, Uber Eats and iFood, uh, that uh, uh, the informal works that uh, haven't stopped to work. And they say like that, I'm working, delivering food, but I'm hungry with the incomes I receive from these global platform jobs. So there are also immigrants campaign for regularization 
And uh, the most significant event that reveals this popular dissatisfaction began two weeks ago in Brazil. There are many anti-fascist demonstrations uh, in many cities in Brazil. And these this demonstrations are uh, led by the football fans with popular support. And these people went to the streets on Sundays to contrast the manifestations led by Bolsonaro for military intervention, which are taking place every Sunday in Brazil since the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic arrived here. So Bolsonaro is systematically defending and even taking part in the, in the, the demonstration against the Congress and the Supreme Court. This pro-Bolsonaro manifestation is still now do not have wide adherence. And uh, we can see that this anti-fascist manifestation have been more voluminous. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Luisi, would you like to continue? Yes, uh, gladly. Uh, will you ask us about the tensions or ruptures that can be observed between um, between different political actors uh, uh, over the past three months? And in in one sense, I would say that you see the same tensions as as pretty much everywhere, uh, but there are some exceptions. There are some ruptures. So uh, I see those ruptures in the terrain for Mexico in the terrain of security and also uh, of emerging cracks in the support of President Lopez Obrador, which used to be very solid and, and, and quite, uh, well, uh, quite spread before the pandemic. So why do I mean by having more or less the same tensions as everywhere? I mean here the, the calibration of measures of response to the pandemic. So there is a lot of debate in Mexico on whether the strategy or the Sentinel uh, strategy is, is the right one uh, or no. So we see that being debated in many countries, whether the government cover, government's decision of confinement or, or of deconfinement are taken at the right moment, where the, whether they are strong enough or too lax. I mean, you that, that's part of a democracy. You have this kind of, let's say, healthy debates of, of whether a government is doing enough or not. So you, you even find that in governments that seem to be doing quite well and enjoy high social trust, uh, like uh, Germany, where I find myself right now. But that is, of, of course, understandably much worse in countries where, where the social trust is very low. Having said that, uh, what, what can be said about the strategy that Mexico has been following right now is that it enjoys uh, the, the support of uh, international organizations like the WHO. So the w, WHO has said that the, this sentinel strategy that goes for low testing is, is not, not is, is, it makes sense actually. And with it is, is actually saying something that um, in, in, in the backdrop of, of the structural and contextual situation that Mexico has, that I described before of high inequality, low coverage of the social system, low quality of the health system, um, uh, insufficient human resources in the health system. So that strategy actually makes sense that you don't impose very strict measures of confinement, but you let people keep on working and you try not to um, not to draw people massively to hospitals as to completely overwhelm the, the very low existing capacity. So in terms of that, there is a healthy range of discussion about the concrete uh, responses in the government, but let's say that international organizations have uh, granted that the strategy is sound from the epidemiological point of view. Uh, now, the other common tension is that delicate balance between protecting the people and their, their health and the economy, which if it keeps worsening, of course, it will also threaten the living situation of, of many, many millions of persons. So in Mexico, this crystallizes through a t tension that already existed between the president and the entrepreneurial sector. 
and, and by this I mean really big business, like you have a handful of families that really um, own um, like 20% of, of Mexico's uh, <laughs> riches. So there are moments of tension between the government and, and these en entrepreneurs that have led to an even more incoherent strategy because at some point when the government tried to manage a coherent consistent message of asking the population to stay home. You had, on the other hand, some entrepreneurs who are also the holders and owners of big TV channels and radio stations, uh, delegitimizing that message from the president and telling people that this pandemic is nonsense. So you have a clash of economic power versus political political power that has become very obvious, this tension. And I think it goes a step beyond this very common tension in all countries right now between protecting health and protecting the economy, which is, I think, very a very valid sort of dilemma. Um, in terms of economic and social policy, there are some ruptures as well, because I see that the president is, is sticking very stubbornly to austerity and to his austerity measures. Instead of using this moment against the advice of his best experts in the, in the economic and the Ministry of Economy, um, instead of using this moment for an aggressive uh, package with measures for spending and, and stimulus, you know, for, for different parts of the economy, or instead of seeking a broad political consensus to implement those uh, measures. Instead of all that, despite of the better advice of, of his um, experts in, in, in economy, the president stubbornly rejects, rejects asking for credit to the IMF. And he only wants to finance the very few, the very scant uh, social, economic and emergency measures on uh, even more austerity. Now, coming to the issue of ruptures, I see uh, in Latin America as a whole, even before the pandemic, there is a growing risk of the return of the military to back different governments from Brazil to uh, Nicaragua to Guatemala and El Salvador. So in Mexico, we don't have so much the risk of the military backing power as we have the state leaving more and more gaps and, and vacuum in the territory, which are quickly taken over by drug cartels and mafias. So these are proper mafias who are not only involved in drugs, but also uh, include um, a wide, wide range of illicit businesses and also the provision of some community service and distribution of, of, of goods. So these mafias also seek legitimacy under the current circumstances of the pandemic by imposing order. So in the absence of very strict measures of confinement, the mafias are in some municipalities imposing very strict curfews. Uh, and also they are providing, so it's a carrot and stick strategy, they also provide the poorest population with boxes with food and hand sanitizer, and even they provide some hospitals with protective uh, equipment. So you see the mafias occupying very quickly those gaps left by a state that was already weak and sadly and incredibly is becoming weaker by a president who is you know, defunding the state more and more. With regard to the political arena, I would say that the most important rupture is, is um, as I said before, in, in the support of the president. Before the pandemic, still until the beginning of March 2020, uh, the president enjoyed, according to several polls, over 80% of the population support. And this has been cracking in the last, in the last months. Uh, so he's supporting, uh, he's losing support very rapidly, especially among the middle classes, because there is this growing feeling of disappointment and, and lack of direction. And again, he sticks to, to some projects that are mostly public works of, of uh, infrastructure instead of putting the money in the health sector. We all know that if he put the money in the health sector now, we wouldn't see a very significant change in the short term because these, these, these investments are medium and especially long term. But there is a growing demand in the population that these investments are finally made, that there is a fiscal reform and the president is set on not making a fiscal reform, on defunding the state, 
And I, I see uh, um, really the, the support of the president cracking in that regard. Even the parliament, one has to say, Lopez Obrador doesn't really have an organized opposition because the opposition, opposition is fully fragmented ever since the election. Uh, but you even see the, the, the same party of the President Morena in Congress trying to propose some more ambitious economic and, and emergency health measures for the population, trying to put pressure on, on, on the President to reconsider his course of affairs. Thank you very much, Lucy, and let's continue with Chandor. Uh, um, the countries of your choice. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, instead of countries, I would like to switch on a very special and vulnerable social uh, group, which is the indigenous people. Uh, we were not touching this uh, very serious issue, which are uh, uh, creating um, actually a huge outcry on international level, and not just in Brazil, but obviously mostly in Brazil. So these people who are mostly living in, uh, in the jungle, in the Amazonia, and uh, um, they are quite in a high level of isolation. Uh, so they are um, even on genetic or in general uh, immune system, they are not really prepared in this kind of um, um, pandemia, what we are living right now. And if you are looking at uh, pictures uh, uh, on the new uh, grapes, what they are um, building, let's say, building in uh, uh, um, in some of the cities of um, um, the Amazonas, uh, mostly in Manaus, uh, then you could see that the um, death ratio uh, among this population is much higher than any kind of um, population in Latin America. And um, most of these people are living in Brazil and the lack of responses from the Brazilian authorities are even uh, uh, making this situation uh, more dire. Um, if you go um, uh, to uh, see uh, the way how they, these people are living, you could see that uh, the general um, uh, system, uh, social system, health system, uh, what they receive is quite low. Uh, so they don't have a canalization, they don't have uh, fresh uh, tap water, uh, they don't have 24-hour um, uh, medical uh, uh, coverage uh, uh, because mostly of the distance and because mostly of their choice that they are living in in a very um, low infrastructure area. And obviously, um, all these uh, um, effects, all these points adding together uh, in this uh, situation right now are worsening uh, the survival rate uh, of any of these uh, uh, tribes. And some of the experts and uh, even the mayor of Manaus uh, is calling uh, this as a genocide uh, by the Brazilian authorities not helping uh, uh, these people. Um, I wouldn't go so far that this is a, an intentional uh, a genocide uh, on these people, but I'm quite sure that uh, they would uh, uh, welcome much more help uh, and much more uh, health coverage uh, in their villages right now. If you are going on the Doctors Without Borders uh, homepage in May, in the end of May, they were doing a, a special call for these people, for the indigenous tribes to, to help them and uh, staying, um, uh, saying some uh, data that on the population uh, in the indigenous tribes, uh, the death ratio is much higher than in the rest uh, uh, of Brazil and they are calling the Brazilian authorities to make some steps and we still don't see uh, much of the solution from uh, this point. So this is a, instead of uh, countries and due to lack of time what we are, I would really just uh, um, say that we should pay much more attention for uh, these people who have, uh, even in, in a normal day, they have much less uh, uh, possibilities uh, uh, in, in health and social issues. And in the time of need, uh, they, would, uh, um, they should receive a higher attention from, from uh, the Brazilian state. Thank you very much, Chandler, and also thank you for reminding me about how quickly the time is passing. Actually, we have been discussing only two questions. Uh, I would like to encourage uh, the audience to post questions in the Q&A because after this third round of questions, you will have the opportunity to have your 
questions answered. So please post your questions uh, if there are any uh, in the Q and A, and I will read them out loud. But in the meantime, uh, I would like to ask all three panelists to really quickly, because nobody sees what the future will bring us. But in in two, three minutes, not more, just some aspects or some food for thought about what possible political, social, and economic effects can come out of this. Some trends that you that you already see in the making uh, in, in these countries, uh, starting with Brazil, Patricia. You're muted. I, I may say that Brazil will have accumulated cadavers and uh, we, it is very clear that we will have economic crisis and recession as well. So uh, the estimation for this year GDP growth go from minus three in a more optimistic scenario to minus 11 in more pessimistic scenario. And obviously the worker class will pay the higher price for these. There are already uh, 40 million jobs, uh, uh, up to 40 million jobs lost. Uh, 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 up to May, uh, there was 4 million works uh, that had uh, their contract suspended. And uh, informality and precarious job uh, will certainly grow. And uh, there will be an additional flexibilization of the labor market that was allowed by the emergency measure, but might be become perennial. And the starvation may increase as well, as I said. And for the political arena, uh, we have a very serious threatens to democracy and it becomes, it may become worse uh, as a response to the conflicts and the tensions that are increasing in society. So there are, um, now there are more uh, than 20 militaries working in the ministries and this presence of the militaries may grow. And um, we know that measures, in, as in other parts of the world, were combined with an increase of social and uh, social control and disrespect of rights. And in the environmental sector, uh, it became very clear that né, during the pandemic, there were many attacks uh, to indigenous people, as uh, Sander was saying and also attempts to approve laws allowing deforestation of areas. Uh, the Minister of Environmental himself, himself declared in a meeting that they could take advantage of the pandemic to approve laws that are harmful to the enver enver environmental. So the necropolitics regarding the indigenous pe people is, uh, is very clear. But also I may say that the, the population is also reacting. There is a pressure to bring down Bolsonaro. There are many requests for impeachment and lawsuits calling for the impeachment. And we hope that the anti-fascist front will get stronger. And uh, we hope as well that this front will be able to add political and social proposals for their action. And summing up, we will have very hard years ahead. Uh, the perspective is increasing in starvation, unemployment, and under unemployment. We expect a huge immigration of Brazilians as well. The reinforcement of the peripheral position of Brazil in the world system by the alignment with the US. And at the political scenario, I would say that either Bolsonaro suffers an impeachment process or there will be a more intense militarization. Thank you very much, Patricia. Let's continue with Lucy. Thank you. Uh, really tough uh, stuff to hear from Patricia. <laughs> well, um, for, for Mexico, the economic effects are, are foreseeable. There will be a contraction of at least 9% in the gross national product. A more exact number is impossible to give, 
uh, right now since there are so many unknowns and variables. This depends a lot on whether the strategy of reopening businesses works, if tourism recovers, if the pandemic has a second uh, wave or not, if oil prices remain constant. Um, so, but the contraction will be really felt by the, by the people. And uh, experts disagree if, the, if, there is a, if there will be a, a soon recovery in the next year or not, but very few that doubt that uh, the estimations for 2021 will have to be downgraded since uh, Mexico, as I said before, and I repeated a few times, is lacking an ambitious social program with economic stimuli uh, to pull the economy back from recession. So what we know so far is that already 2 million formal jobs have been lost in April and May. And that already for an economy that has very few formal jobs, it's a big tragedy. Um, and in terms of, of, of politics, the, the effects that are foreseeable and that are very worrisome is a further weakening of the state uh, capacities and structures. We already knew that the state has a, had a patchy presence in the Mexican territory, but this is going to, to become a, a more acute reality since it's, it's getting even more defunded in these times of the, of the pandemic. And to close on a, on a more hopeful note, um, I, I have uh, read some social policy experts who are analyzing the responses to the pandemic and they see this as an appropriate moment to mount pressure on political institutions to have a fiscal reform that has been needed for a very long time in Mexico uh, that will allow the government to have more fiscal space for spending and uh, a, a, a transition to another model of social protection and and to more uh spending in in health so for now total health spending in mexico is very low uh compared to the average across oecd countries and even compared to other latin american countries so we have now a public health system that was already saturated and in which workers were already excessively um, overworked, badly paid, and without sufficient supplies. And many experts are, are thinking that this is the right moment to, to find a change of course over the long term for health and social policies in Mexico. And just as a counter example, I would like to mention um, that the problems that we have been discussing mostly in this talk about low social spending, low coverage of the population in the health system, high inequality. They also, uh, I think it, it would be important to, to keep in mind that this is not a, a Pan-American reality, that there are some few exceptions in Latin America to this worrisome trend. And uh, countries like Costa Rica or like Uruguay are doing much better in, the, in how they are handling the pandemic with very low fatalities uh, absolute, in absolute numbers and, and also mortal, low mortality rates of those who actually get sick. And the explanation for that lies precisely in a sustained level of investment in, the, in strong health uh, sectors for decades. So these are countries who made these decisions already decades ago and they provide universal access to the health system, to all their all their citizens and they are institutionally strong so what that that's something that also characterizes these these two countries strong democratic institutions and a high level of social and political trust so i think it's just important to remind that this is the the panorama in in brazil and in mexico and in in some central american countries is very dire but we also have in the region the example of some other countries who, ha who seem to have made uh, better decisions in the past and thereby are, are in, in terms of uh, the responses, the short-term responses to the pandemic. Thank you very much, Lucy. Also, thank you very much for bringing in something positive to the end of this otherwise quite dark uh, topic. Uh, Shandor, would you like to add? Um, it's really hard to add anything after uh, the two um, ladies uh, because they, they were all uh, shooting out all of my points which I, I made here. 
the only thing which uh, um, obviously as a kind of general um, uh, conclusion is that I foresee uh, a quite a high increase in poverty and deep poverty in the region, um, mostly um, uh, due to uh, the loss of um, uh, informal and formal uh, uh, jobs. And the other point which I uh, foresee that this uh, crisis together with the American uh, uh, sanctions and even hardening sanctions, I think that in Cuba and in Venezuela, they could uh, reach a point which um, um, could show some kind of uh, um, social and political, even unrest and, and boiling uh, in these two countries. Uh, but obviously they are, um, uh, how to say, they are managing uh, in the last, uh, um, in, in case of Cuba, actually more than half a century of uh, crisis they are managing uh, somehow. So I'm not sure that this will, um, um, lead to the fall of uh, the Cuban or the Venezuelan regime, but they will uh, get them some uh, uh, sleepless nights, that's for sure. Thank you very much. I'm checking at the questions and the answers, but so far no questions have arrived from the audience. I would like to encourage you to, to post your questions because now is the time. Uh, in the meantime, I do have one question, which uh, because we have been uh, analyzing the things on the national or the subnational level, but I would like to uh, bring in the question of the interstate relations, either between Latin American countries or between a Latin American country and uh, external powers, big powers from uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, do you see any sort of uh, changes in the settings? either between countries in Latin America or uh, great powers like, like the US, China, um, European Union uh, also, uh, which is changing uh, related to or parallel to what is happening with the pandemic. And, and the floor is open, so I, I do not really uh, direct the question to, to any specific panelist. From my point of view, I think um, most of these regions are still focusing on themselves. Uh, China is trying to pro prohibit and somehow uh, foresee the second wave. Uh, Europe is uh, first trying to, to get their first steps out of the curfew. United States in, in still in, in uh, disarray and preparing for the next uh, elections. So I don't think that right now this is a priority for any of the big powers to change policies uh, towards this region. Uh, however, um, uh, I think that it will come. Not now, but in half a year, some of the countries will realize uh, that uh, there are some possibilities because where there are crises, there are possibilities. Uh, so I'm quite sure that some of the, um, um, the companies, some of the countries will use uh, this uh, uh, crisis as an opportunity to spread their influence and to buy and to invest. And obviously you have to have a look at which are the countries with uh, free uh, money or, or um, I mean free money to invest. And the list is quite short. So I, I foresee that um, uh, the Chinese uh, companies will get uh, even uh, bigger possibilities in, in Latin America at the moments of needs uh, in these countries. Thank you very much, Luisi. Yeah, just very shortly, I would like to second that point by, by Shandor. I think that if there is any player that has made um, uh, itself present, uh, even through the toughest times of the pandemic in different countries in the, in the region was China offering some politics of help already very early into the pandemic, sending some protective uh, 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 gear for the hospitals and so on. And, uh, and also uh, in, in a very modest way, you can see that, that there is a competition, right? Regional competition and some geopolitics going on because this is the only sort of circumstance in which the government, current government of the United States seem to worry about what is happening in Mexico and then offered also to send to Mexico some ventilators. So you, you see that, that modest uh, competition. But uh, in terms of the Mexican government, 
it's the tendency that we saw already since the inauguration of Lopez Obrador government that he is not a president that looks beyond the borders. He's very, very self-centric and uh, does, does not really believe or I, I think understand very much uh, international politics or foreign affairs and delegates these areas completely to his minister, minister of foreign affairs who has become very, very powerful on, under this government. Thank you. So, uh, I also would say that there is no coordination at all uh, from Brazil with the other uh, countries in Latin America. And, uh, we know that uh, to the reconstruction, uh, the economy reconstruction, it would be very important to do it. But uh, since uh, Bolsonaro is in power, his policy is a bilateral uh, relation with USA. No, actually, uh, doing this, he's reinforcing our place uh, as a periphery in the world system. No, and uh, actually, uh, he is breaking with Mercosur, with BRICS, and he has no interest at all to coordinate policy with the, the, the other uh, countries from periphery world system. Thank you very much. In the meantime, I have received one question from the audience. I will read it. I heard about the solidarity movement in Colombia called the Pañuelos Rojos, and I would like to ask if there was more movements like this in other countries in Latin America and if they could work well. So any sort of grassroots uh, solidarity movement or self-help movement uh, which goes beyond this traditional, the state gives something and the population accept it. Do you have uh, either uh, about the Pañuelos Rojos or about uh, any other uh, grassroots movement uh, in, in any country that you know about? And this time it's also an open question to all panelists. Patricia? I would say the example of the movement of St. Terras, uh, the people that without land, they are very strong here in Brazil and they are doing a very beautiful campaign of giving uh, uh, food for population because they produce food without agrotoxic, without poison. <laughs> and uh, they give uh, a lot of uh, food for the big cities, for poor population, and this is a very important uh, uh, movement that shows that the solidarity can be very strong also in the critical moments in a crisis. And uh, there are also, like I could say that because I studied the movements of immigrants uh, in Sao Paulo city, that they are very active as well to help people to regularize uh, documents, to receive the, the income, um, the emergency income, because they have right to receive it even if they don't have documents. So they are very active in Sao Paulo. And uh, I, I may say that we should look for this um, solidarity as well. It's a very good question because of the, uh, in this way of doing politics, we can see also uh, other perspective for the world. Thank you very much. Lucy, Shandor, would you like to add something to this? No, sadly, I don't have uh, much to add to that. I, I don't know of a uh, of very particular um, movement like that in Mexico, other than maybe small businesses supporting each other, some funding platforms for small businesses. And the truth is, in Colombia, uh, the circumstances for this Pañuelos Rojos thing are that they imposed a very strict uh, confinement. So people had to recur to some uh, physical signal on, on their windows in order to express uh, their emergency situation. And uh, since, since we don't have that in Mexico, there was no such strict confinement. People could always leave their homes and there was no uh, strict policing of, of the movement, but always everything stayed at the level of recommendation. So the situation never got to be that dire that people had to record to that kind of expression of, of distress in the form of, of the Pañuelo Rojo. 
Okay, thank you very much. I see no more questions from the audience and I believe that uh, fortunately that this question uh, has led us to, to some sort of at least vaguely positive ending of this discussion. So I would like to thank you very much for being, us, uh, being with us uh, today. So I would like to thank you once again for Lucy Pedrosa, Patricia Villan and Chandra Dulanaj for accepting uh, the invitation of our institute. I believe that even though the topic itself is quite sad, but it's always a good uh, thing to, to contrast what is happening in the individual countries and to have some sort of systemic uh, look at one um, world region. So thank you very, very much once again. Thank you for the attendees who have uh, been with us uh, in this live broadcast. And uh, the recording of this talk will be available on uh, the website of the Institute within a couple of days. Uh, uh, we will keep in touch. This series of coronavirus and world regions is going to continue uh, uh, with the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, so please um, check every now and then um, what uh, events we offer um, about this topic and about other topics as well. So thank you very much once again. And it was thank a pleasure you. to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you, thank you very much. everyone who attended. And uh, I'm very happy to participate in an, in an event that brings the reality of Latin America closer to Hungary. And very grateful for your interest. Thank you as well. For me, it was a pleasure. And thank you for the audience as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.